And now a little about our presenter. Alexis Nicole Nelson is a forager, author, cook, and creator who has fostered a huge following by sharing her entertaining and educational content. Helping folks learn how to identify and prepare the edible plants she finds growing around her neighborhood in Ohio and on her travels. Welcome, Alexis. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Grace. And thank you to the U.S. Botanic Gardens for having me again. These classes are always so much fun. I am not in my usual Ohio today. I am coming to you live from Prairie Island in Minnesota. Uh, later this afternoon, me and some of my friends are going to be doing a Wapato harvest. But for the time being, we are here to talk about those little guys that wear the cute little hats and are a quintessential symbol of fall around the world, the acorn. I uh, hope everyone is ready for how weirdly passionate I am about acorns. They're a bit of an obsession of mine. I spend most of the year eagerly awaiting acorn season again. <laughs> so without further ado, a presentation that is also a nut rant. We love to see it. <laughs> I feel like Grace's intro. Oh, I'm oh. so sorry, Alexis. Sorry to jump in. I was just wondering, could I ask you to mute your notifications if possible? Oh, absolutely. You can. Let me go to my settings. And, do, 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 do. and yes, mute all notifications. Thank you, Grace. That way you guys can all type away without hearing what, what, what every five seconds from my computer. Oh, Max, you just ground your first acorn flower yesterday. Yes. I hope I can give you some good ideas and some great books to look at that will help you have even more ideas to know what to do with those acorns. My name is Alexis. Um, I am an outdoor educator. Uh, I have worn many hats in my day, but these days that is my main job. I mainly do that in the form of video content that I aim to make as accessible as humanly possible because I feel like this knowledge should belong to everybody. Uh, but also sometimes I get to do really fun things like classes like this one. Uh, I also am 100% a forest goblin, though I do feel obligated to say uh, I am very tall for a forest goblin. I met some wonderful new friends yesterday here on Fairy Island, and everyone remarked about how tall I am. So I always tell people I'm kind of like this little goblin in the woods, and I think it makes people think I'm short. I'm six feet tall. I'm sorry to shatter your illusion you may have had via the online space. <laughs> Thank you for your laughing emojis. I live off of your praise. <laughs> so, oh, we have some folks, yeah, in the chat who said, I didn't even know you could eat acorns. Listen, you are going to never be able to forget you can eat acorns after this class. So let's start with acorns. I love them. I don't know what it is. Ever since I was a kid, the second they would start falling, I would know, one, Halloween is coming. Love Halloween. My whole family gets down to Halloween. We were the fun folks who would put up like a giant spider web on our entire house. Uh, and it meant that the cold season was coming. And I love the holidays. I love cozy times. Acorns were always a fun signal of the changing of seasons. Moving from that end of summer Theoretically, I say, as it is still record temperatures in a lot of the United States right now, uh, and moving swiftly into the fall harvest season. I have made a lot of acorn videos. You may have seen some of them. You may not have seen some of them. But I just need you to know that every time I film an acorn video, it is at least four times as long as what ends up being shown to the general public. So thank you so much for being my captive audience to hear about why these nuts are so dang cool. So anyway, the rant with slides. Let's start with what people generally know about acorns, which honestly is not that much. One, nice and basic, acorns come from oaks. I say basic, 
And I say that with like a little asterisk next to it for some people, that's not basic information. A lot of times, especially us plant obsessed folks, take our little bit of a lack of plant blindness for granted. Uh, I have definitely taught people this year who are my age that those acorns on the ground are coming from oak trees, uh, members of the Quercus genus, which are members of the beech family. Next, stylish hats. Oh my God, what an icon. There's a reason that they are the symbol of fall and it's cause they're dressed for it, you know? They're ready. There's a crisp in the air, mm, they have a beanie. What is it knit out of? I need to know. Every year I speak into the ether that someone who's better at knitting or crocheting than me will make me a little acorn cap. Uh, that being said, I have a lot of hair for hats. So it is a challenge and I get why no one has taken me up on it yet. I just need to learn how to make one myself. <laughs> oh, <laughs> someone said Quercus. Quercus, I'll type it for the chat, even though I think we're gonna see it quite a bit later. Quercus. Oh, art beat me to it. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, Zachary said, I, do I have a PO box? No, but I will make one. <laughs> if it means I get a hat. Next, squirrels are very passionate about acorns. Um, I never get yelled at by squirrels more than during acorn season. Squirrels are like a little bit smarter than we think they are. I have had squirrels throw acorns at me. Very aggressive. I usually, if I'm harvesting from the stand of burr oaks in my neighborhood, I am not kidding. I will bring an offering for, for the squirrels so they won't drop those acorns on my head because burr oaks are a hefty tree nut. You do not want to take one of those to the knob. So sometimes I'll be like, oh, well, I have a ton of hazelnuts from my harvest last week. I'm going to bring them a little pile of cracked hazelnuts, you know, put my thumbs to good use or bring them a little bit of fruit or veggies from my garden so they will stay busy with those and still get some calories and I get to gather my acorns. <laughs> uh, thankfully, no squirrel has, has nailed me in the head with a burr oak yet, but they've gotten very close this year. I think it's because I had started using an apple picker to get my burr oaks before they hit the ground and the squirrels were not cool with me suddenly not being as ground bound. But also, I didn't add apple picker to the tools suggestion page. So tuck that away if you're someone with a tall oak tree with especially large oaks. Apple pickers, excellent for getting those guys down ahead of time. <laughs> oh, someone's in the Netherlands. It's a rough passage to have acorns fall on your head while you bite. Oh, no. That is such a fanciful yet painful rite of passage. And I love that for you guys. <laughs> So next, yes, you might twist your ankle walking on them during your morning walk in the fall. They are very rolly, a little bit dangerous, but that's one of the things that I like about them. I think that's fun. I love that they have a little bit of danger. I love that every time I'm committed to harvesting in my platform Crocs, I'm like, today might be the day that I lose my ankles. Who knows? Who's to say what the future holds? Also, and I swear this is such a unified experience, at least for us in the Midwest. Everyone I know has like that one time that either you were dared to eat an acorn or you dared someone you cared about to eat an acorn. And they were like, this is the worst thing I've ever put into my mouth hole. Please give me the $5 that you promised me and never talk to me again. And because of that experience, so many of us had it stuck in our noggin that acorns are not edible. <laughs> I'm glad that some of you didn't have this experience. It just means that you were nicer to your siblings than some of us here in the Midwest, where honestly, this time of year, what else are we doing? Going to corn mazes, picking apples? No, daring your siblings and cousins and friends to eat a raw acorn off the ground. <laughs> Which I will say, 
and we'll talk about this a little more later, there are some acorns with which that will be a more pleasant experience than others. My first raw acorn was an American red oak, and that was dumb. I did a dumb. It was bad. If you're going to choose an acorn to try a little bit of raw, because that little bit of tannicness won't hurt you. There's also tannins in tea and wine. Uh, don't choose a red oak. <laughs> Someone, oh, I don't think anyone dared me. I just tried it. Honestly, Catherine, I admire your dedication to the scientific method. <laughs> Sakurai says there's red oaks near your house. That's okay. We're going to learn how to render them palatable. Every oak, red oaks, white oaks, black oaks, coastal live oaks, all of them. We're going to teach you how to make them all into tasty treats. So let's get into things that some people might not know about acorns and oaks in general. Oh no, I just finished reaching the tannins from my forage and now they're drying in the oven. Yay, oh my God, Sean, once again, I applaud your bravery in trying those acorns raw. It is not a great experience. It is not wonderful. I will say if you still have some of that tannin water though, my friend Linda Black Oak uses it as a toner for her face and her skin's amazing. So there might be something to it. I don't know why I didn't add that fun tidbit into the presentation. I hope everyone also has a notebook. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so, oaks. I feel like a lot of us in the Northern hemisphere take them for granted because they're so ubiquitous. We feel like they're absolutely everywhere. And honestly, in the Northern Hemisphere, they are. They are this beautiful unifier um, of a time that are reminiscent of a time when Asia, Europe, and North America were all conjoined before the continents all continued separating, going on their separate ways. Um, so that is one thing to know. No, Sean, you dumped the liquid. That's okay. That's okay. There's more acorns out there. And that's the joy of it all. <laughs> but as I remember, every single time I post acorn content online, um, our Southern Hemisphere friends are not quite as lucky. They might have some that are planted as ornamentals, but that is not the half of the globe that oaks enjoy growing in the most. That being said, there are some really cool oak species that have found their way down through Mesoamerica into the northern tip, the like most northernmost point of South America. And we're actually going to talk about that species later because it's awesome for reasons I will reveal soon. Next, odds are someone in your lineage at some point in the past has needed acorns to survive. Acorns, not super prevalent in our diets today. They've mostly been replaced with grains, which are easier to process once you've gathered them. But someone in your lineage, whether it's as recently as, say, World War II, where a lot of Europeans had to turn to acorns during times when there were just a lot of rations, heavy rations put on food products. A lot of people started trading out their coffee, which was being sent to troops with acorn coffee, started trading out their flour, which was also being used to feed troops with acorn flour. Honestly, I could give an entire presentation on a lot of the wild food that parts of Europe returned to during that time. We saw like linden leaf flour make another research, make a resurgence during that period of time. Oh, acorn coffee. Yes, Misha. Once again, I did not do a deep dive into acorn coffee, but we'll talk about it when we get to the processing slides because it's easy peasy lemon squeezy. <laughs> Next. So I kind of alluded to this already. And by alluded to it, I mean, I pretty much already said this, despite the fact that acorns were a large portion of the culinary history uh, of North and Central America, European and Asian cuisine, they've been largely replaced with grains because grains are just easier for us to grow, easier for us to process easier for us to monetize because monoculturing them is so much easier. Um, that being said, in both the Iberian Peninsula and in sections of California, people have been 
resourceful and smart and working with the environment to create these oak pastures, these oak prairies, where it's pretty much just oaks dominating all of the tree line and then short underbrush underneath, which in the Iberian Peninsula is still used to feed pigs. Um, and then in California, a lot of indigenous groups are still using those coastal live oaks. <laughs> I'm so happy everyone's having a good time. Oh, Melanie says that I learned about acorn flower. Oh, from Parable of the Sower. It's such a good book. Oh, I love Octavia Butler so much. And that is so many people's uh, introduction to finding out that acorns are edible. If you are a sci-fi fan and you have not read Parable of the Sower, I highly recommend it. Highly recommend it. So it's not I used to hate live oaks. Their leaves are so pointy. They are. But the acorns are so good. They're one of the ones that need less leaching than some other species. And I'm very envious that you live near them. I'm never in California during oak harvest. And it makes me very sad. <laughs> So as I said, there are exceptions to this though. You will still see acorns in the Iberian Peninsula. It's mostly used as livestock feed, which makes me sad because people should be eating them too. Also Greece is seeing a resurgence in acorns returning to their cuisine. And actually I'm gonna talk about the book written by a woman who's partially responsible for that at the end of this presentation. But in California and in Korea, Acorns are still a regular part of people's diets. Um, anyone in here who is of Korean descent might be familiar with the torimuk, which is a Korean acorn jelly, which we're going to talk about later. <laughs> oh, that's where all the emojis are coming from. TB, whatever your daughter needs to do to be interested in acorns, I will take it. Yes, Christina, acorn jelly is delicious. It is so good. My partner also doesn't believe me, but it just means that I get more. <laughs> During the World Wars, many Europeans came back to acorns as a food source and coffee replacement. But what ended up happening is during the time of like major economic growth in a lot of countries and even in the United States after the World Wars, foraging in general was considered something to do in famine times. And it was considered kind of improper, something that maybe signaled that you didn't have as much money as your neighbors. And let me tell you, culturally, people will not drop a habit faster than if they think it makes them look bad to their neighbors. So that was how acorns kind of fell by the wayside again after having a chance at making a comeback. Oh, a chinkapin oak. Adrian, we're going to talk about chinkapin oaks later too. Y'all are just calling out all my favorite species. So on the Iberian Peninsula, you may have heard of, um, what is it? Iberico pigs and the ham that comes from them. That is a name that is reserved for pigs that are exclusively raised on acorns. Those pigs have never eaten anything other than acorns. And honestly, it actually changes um, like the saturated versus unsaturated fat content within the pigs themselves, which I think is pretty neat. Some nutty science. Now we're going to talk about some of the reasons why we should be eating acorns. First, if we are, oh, some BK says unprocessed acorns. Yes. Yes, Hamul and Ibirico is the ham from those pigs that has that have exclusively been raised on acorns. They only live and forage underneath those like oak savanna areas on the Iberian Peninsula. And uh, I'm in love with acorns, same, same. But yeah, the pigs eat unprocessed acorns and we're gonna touch on species that can and can't eat unprocessed acorns in a couple of slides actually. You guys are so ready. So acorns. An acorn fresh off the tree by weight, it's about 41% carbohydrates, about 24% fat. They have a pretty high oil content, higher than I think a lot of people expect from them, and 6% protein. 
because of that fat content, they can spoil very easily. So that's something we'll talk about when it comes to storing your acorns. Acorns are especially high in vitamin B6, in your folate, in your manganese, but they also have iron, copper, calcium, and phosphorus. Shout out to my fellow like chronic anemic people. No matter what I do, I'm always, I'm always at least a little bit low in iron. So acorn season, I get to do a little something about that. The remaining percentage is water. Thank you, Valerie. I was hoping someone was going to ask that question. Yes, that is the acorns by weight when they are fresh off the tree. And when they are fresh off the tree, their water content is still pretty high. Thank you. I feel like I tricked you into asking that question, but I actually really wanted someone to be curious enough to ask. So I really appreciate that, Valerie. <laughs> How do those stats compare to other nuts that we eat? Honestly, they are a little lower in protein and higher in carbohydrates than a lot of nuts. And <laughs> Valerie does get a gold star today. And honestly, Kim, that's fine. If I was taking this class, I also would have been the person who was like, ah, yes, those are numbers. Continue the learning, please. <laughs> so acorns famously contain tannins. Tannins are the reason that when you or maybe a loved one took a bite of a raw acorn for the first time, it made your mouth super angry at you. But those tannins are really important for the acorn itself because they act as a natural preservative for that tree embryo. Um, a lot of times white oaks will be a little bit uh, lower on the tannin scale, but that is because white oaks germinate faster than red oaks do. White oaks will begin germinating like right now. White oaks will hit the ground and in a week or so could have a taproot going already. Whereas red oaks, over winter, so they need to have that higher tannin content to overwinter effectively without going bad before they germinate in the spring. <laughs> you guys are so nice. So not only do tannins taste bad, but high levels of tannins interfere with our ability to metabolize protein. Uh, so that's pretty bad news bears. Not something that you want your diet to be doing to you at all. Yes, that is why you put oak leaves in when you are making pickles, because those tannins act as an additional preservative for your pickles, helping them stay crisp instead of maybe getting soggy as some pickles are oft want to do. Tannins in small quantities are actually pretty good for us. There are tannins in tea, and especially red wine. There are a little bit of tannins in dark chocolate. Tannins do also interfere with taking in uh, iron, Anna, yes. You guys know so much. Oak leaf pickles, yes, if you are making uh, pickles, pickled veggies, putting an oak leaf or two in with the brine and the vegetables will actually help your pickles stay more crisp than they would have otherwise. So because those tannins interfere with our ability to metabolize proteins, we cannot eat raw acorns in large quantities. You could eat one raw acorn, and other than the fact that it might ruin your day, you would not suffer any other ill effects. But sometimes people have to worry about horses who, like us, also have interference with protein metabolization after eating acorns, and horses don't necessarily know better. Horses can get super sick if they just go to town grazing on acorns like those pigs on the Iberian Peninsula get to. Ooh, someone says like a raw oak leaf fresh off the tree. Yes. Yeah. So if you're going to do that, go fast because trees are starting to drop leaves in my neck of the woods. <laughs> so animals that can eat uh, our wonderful acorn friends without any processing. Deer, who this time of year, their diet can be up to 25% acorns as they are trying to bulk up for the winter time. Pigs, of course, as we have discussed. Jaybirds and bears also have no issues eating acorns in their raw state. Their digestive tract uh, works with those tannins much better than ours does. Yes, Krista, oh my gosh, yes. Please make sure that Emma doesn't get into a lot of acorns or at least 
make sure that they're leached first. And I'm going to teach you how to do that shortly. The other 75% of deer's diet is my garden, apparently. Yes, turkeys can also eat acorns completely raw. Though in my neck of the woods, turkeys are really liking the little tubers from Chufa this time of year. <laughs> and honestly, yeah, deer are, they're lovable scamps this time of year. <laughs> we'll have to know if we can eat the pickled leaves. You know, I've never tried to eat the leaf from my pickles before. I'm going to have to look into this for you, Zachariah, because you deserve an answer to this question. And it's going to plague me until I know. I feel like it's just the one or two leaves. And because the tannins are water soluble, they'd be leaching into the brine. So theoretically, but I don't want to give you a hard and fast answer until I know. I'm going to do some, I'm going to do some research. <laughs> Some more nut facts. Oak trees mast. They are not the only trees that mast, but they are maybe one of the more famous masting trees because they're easier for us humans to notice. And that means they vary the amount of acorns that they produce from year to year. Um, and also sometimes in longer or shorter periods. Some acorns only take six months to completely come to volition. Some take closer to 18 months. Uh, there are some giant species that can take up to five years to produce their acorns. But oak trees fall into this rhythm of mast. I don't want to call it a pattern because it really is more of a rhythm than a pattern. So a mast year is what we call a year with a high acorn drop, a year where oak trees have just gone to town and made a ton of acorns and dropped them all. Something that I think is so cool is that oak trees coordinate their mast years with each other, with their other oak neighbors. And that is one way that a lot of forest ecosystems especially will stay balanced. Trees are so cool in the ways that they communicate with each other, which we're now seeing through science is happening through mycelium sometimes. We're still not 100% sure how oak trees know when to and when not to mast with one another, but science is thankfully diving into these things more, which makes my heart happy. So how does this process help balance forest ecosystems? Well, during years of mast, animal populations will grow. There will be more birds, more squirrels, rodents, and in turn, more of the predators that live off of those animals that eat acorns. And that means that those populations will get to grow. But then, you know, oaks don't want to have populations get completely out of control. That would keep the oaks from getting to do what they're really trying to do with their acorns, which is make more oak trees. So they will also have lean years in which they will drop significantly fewer acorns, if any acorns at all. And after those years, it kind of acts like a natural culling for the species that live around it and rely on them, which in turn culls the species that rely on those species. They're honestly just like sitting there doing this balancing act for the ecosystems that they exist within. This is my favorite. For some reason, without fail, every time the Central Park Oaks, it's just the Central Park Oaks, are going through a lean year, the New York Times will make an article about it and be like, Everything is awful because the oaks don't have acorns this year. And now everyone's going to get Lyme disease because all the ticks that were going to be on all those extra rodents are going to be on us, which is like actually really not the way that it works. In fact, if anything, it should be a less Lyme disease year the following year because there will be fewer other animals for ticks to be living off of. It truly is the circle of life. I want to be lifting my kitten uh, into the sun like Simba. <laughs> it feels like the NYT's version of Mercury in retrograde. Yes. 
Agreed. And it's like, and even in the articles, they will say that oak trees go through cycles, but they'll just come up with like a new reason why squirrels having fewer acorns that year means bad business for the New York population. Oh, Zachariah, I'm glad you love Push Pop. I love Push Pop so much. He's my little lion baby. And my words to the to the New York Times, Oaks are just trying to help you regulate yourselves. Oaks are just like, okay, the rodent population's getting a little crazy. We're going to work together. And instead of putting a ton of energy towards acorns, we're going to work on ourselves this year. Going to maybe try and see if I can grow my canopy a couple of feet. You know, we can't always be working on others. Sometimes we have to work on ourselves. Oh my gosh, Zachariah, thank you for the Colonel Mustard love too. Maybe you need to write an op-ed to see the NYT. Listen, the next time that one of these articles comes out, I will. I will, I will do it. <laughs> the Oaks are just out here like, listen, we have been like the steady hand on these lands for such a long time. And these humans keep trying to throw things out of whack. And I'm just out here trying my best. Oh, The Hidden Life of Trees is such a good book recommendation, Kim. Yes. Everyone, add that to their list. Okay, thank you, Evelyn. I like that they think the rats don't have other food sources in New York City. Thank you. Thank you. It just means that they're going to be going somewhere else <laughs> and eating someone else's food. <laughs> I know this is so many facts, guys, you don't understand. I love, I love acorns so much. And I'm just so glad that you guys are all here to listen to me talk about them. So there were at least 12 distinct indigenous groups that relied on Quercus agrifolia, which is the coastal live oak on the West Coast. A lot of those groups, I have like friends who are Miwok who still do acorn harvest though. Normally it centers around special occasions now. Um, I will say another thing that makes me upset is the stifling of planned burns on the West Coast. One, obviously we are seeing that that doesn't work because that buildup of all of that dry matter just means that when a wildfire happens, it's going to burn out of control and be absolutely terrifying. But also planned burns, not just smart for clearing out the underbrush, also a very deliberate method in which those indigenous groups worked with and farmed acorns. Planned burns, one, help eliminate acorn pests that are hanging out in the soil underneath the trees. In, our, in my neck of the woods, it's like acorn weevils, but there are moth larvae on the West Coast that also love doing a munch and a crunch on an acorn. Two, it helps re recycle a lot of nutrition back into the soil underneath those oaks. And it helps eliminate the underbrush that is competing with the oaks for nutrition. And oaks are a pretty fire resilient tree, especially with a planned burn that has a distinct start and end time. Oaks are a very resilient species. And I just think that is such a good example of us entering a mutually beneficial relationship with trees and especially with oaks, because I mainly see people working against them, people being frustrated at oaks producing acorns and all of the wildlife it brings into the yards and all the cleanup they feel like they have to do. Um, and also, I just love any time that I get to be like colonialism, ruining things again, as per usual, as per usual. Oh, Thank you, past me. This would be uh, an additional uh, great time for me to also talk about acorn processing in South Korea. <laughs> oh my God, Zachariah, yes. I also hate when people think that protecting nature is ignoring it. Uh, yes. I also hate when people think that we are separate entities from nature. Um, we all are meant to, like all living beings are meant to be interacting with each other. That is a completely different rant. Oh, that I want to go on so bad, but that's not what I'm supposed to be talking about right now. <laughs> so 
rant, rant, rant. <laughs> don't encourage me, you guys. We will be here all day. We will be here all day. <laughs> so something that I think is really cool, and it is one of the few instances you still see of Acorn Gathering being used for anything even remotely large businessy is in South Korea where the Tori Mook and like a lot of different acorn noodles and dishes still show up in people's everyday cuisine. What does that mean? Not everybody has time to be out processing acorns. What does that mean? If they want to be making something like acorn jelly, they have to be able to go to the store and buy a bag or a pouch of acorn starch. What does that mean? A company has to be able to process those acorns to supply it to those people. So in a lot of different factories in South Korea, uh, they community source their acorns. And I think that acorns are such a great community builder if you let them. I love this. I love knowing that there are just folks on the hillsides in South Korea who are going, gathering these acorns, and then bringing them to these companies for the companies to be able to process them in mass. So then everyone can get the benefit from them. And a reason why I wanted to bring this up is because a lot of people will disparage acorns, even once they know more about them, because they say that the processing and the gathering is very time consuming. It is absolutely time consuming if you are doing it by yourself. It is so much less time consuming and actually very fun and invigorating when you are working as a group. When you are going out and gathering those nuts with friends and with family, you're going to take a whole lot more home. When you are processing them with friends and family, you will work through getting all of those shells cracked, getting all of the papery skin on the inside removed, grinding them, getting them through water. I have this dream someday in the future when I start planning it far enough in advance of having like an acorn party or an acorn festival at our house in the fall where everyone brings the acorns that are falling in their neighborhood together and we all get to share the tools that I have for all of my food processing and work together to make everything and they'll, we'll have music and snacks and everyone will get to interact with each other. It's just a dream that I've had. And I just think acorns have a really good opportunity to be community builders. So all of you, please take the acorn party idea and run. You don't have to attribute it to me. I just want this to be something that's happening in the world. Yes, H Mart does have uh, acorn powder for acorn jelly if you are lucky enough to live near an H Mart. I do not have H Mart in my neck of the woods, but we have a couple international markets that do stock acorn powder. Thank goodness, because I've had times when I've run out of my own. And when you have a hankering, you just, you gotta have acorn jelly. It's so good. <laughs> there we go. I love that you guys are also in here being so sweet, so supportive, and also making such great suggestions for everyone else. So acorn jelly is not sweet. It's more savory and nutty. A lot of times it is served um, with salad, with a little bit of like soy sauce or green onion on top or red pepper flakes. They are, oh, uh, it's, mwah. you could make a sweet acorn jelly, I feel, if you wanted to, just by adding some sweetener to the mix while you are making it. And I feel like that'd be tasty. I've made little acorn boba before for my tea by adding a little bit of maple syrup in as I was mixing my acorn starch and hot water and thickening it up. And it was very tasty. So savory or sweet, get you a girl who can do both. Okay, so we have some acorns of note. I have to talk about Quercus and Cygnus. One, I'm very mad that we don't have like a standardized English name for this acorn. It's actually very depressing to me. <laughs> and I really need everyone to come together and insist that this acorn gets a name. 
Two, it is notable because it is one of the southernmost growing acorns and that it is distinctly Mesoamerican. You will find it in like southern Mexico through Central America and in very rare cases in the northern stretches of South America. Um, it is the biggest acorn in the world. I also, oh, the Alexis acorn. No, I don't deserve that. I didn't discover it. I want to find, I want to do digging and see if there are any historical documents from the area that show use for it. I don't know. I feel like it deserves a distinctly Mesoamerican name. We all can discuss it. We can have a discussion session in which we all suggest names later because nothing would make me happier. <laughs> A lot of times people will tell you that the bur oak is the largest acorn in the world. And yes, Kate, exactly. Surely there must be an indigenous name for it. And I want to know it. And I want that to be the name that we call it when we're talking about it, instead of having to refer to it by its binomial nomenclature. Um, because as I'm sure you smart people are also very aware, binomial nomenclature is also rampant with colonialism rampant with <laughs> botanical racism. <laughs> so I really want to find out uh, like an indigenous Mesoamerican name for this. And I want that to be the name that we call it. I don't care if it's long, it's what I want. <laughs> but people will say that bur oaks are the biggest acorns in the world. And as much as I wish we could take, as much as like us in the Midwest wish that we could take that for ourselves, we're not the only ones with bur oaks. The Mid-Atlantic also has bur oaks. Southern part of New England has bur oaks. The Southeast has bur oaks. The general South has bur oaks. Even patches of Northern Mexico have bur oaks. Um, but it's not. Look at this guy. That's like, that is a palm sized acorn. I think I would cry. I would cry. Ooh, yes, ask you upon Holly about that binomial colonialism. So disrespectful. Y'all are trying to make me have every conversation today. Also, Yupon Holly, amazing. My favorite tea. I'm so sad I don't live far south enough to harvest it. But when friends bring me some, it is truly the greatest gift. No, you would not want to have that fall on you, Krista. That would be a bad day. Oh my God. You'd get taken out. You'd come to several hours later. Um, and the squirrels will have indoctrinated you into their society. And you'd never be seen again. <laughs> now, I do still have to shout out the bur oak. <laughs> Don't threaten me with a good time. I mean, honestly, this is the time of year in which I'm just like, I could be a squirrel. That sounds like a good time. Especially now that I found out that apparently the most plentiful squirrel in the state, Ohio state of Ohio is not the gray squirrel like I thought. It's actually the southern flying squirrel. I want to be a Southern flying squirrel. Who was going to tell me? It's because they're nocturnal. We never see them. But apparently there's more of them than every other squirrel species in Ohio. I'm getting off track again. Yes, Laura, right? And it's not just Ohio. It's so much of the Eastern United States. I didn't even know we had a native flying squirrel species until like two weeks ago. And now I'm a little bit obsessed with them. They've been my hyperfixation along with my yearly acorn hyperfixation, which is great. They go hand in hand. Both involve me spending a lot of time with big trees. <laughs> you found a link with a native name for the acorn. I'm opening this for later. I'm like doing my little command click so I can read this later. Thank you, Zachariah. <laughs> Bur oaks are fantastic, though. I always tell people when they ask me, which acorn is the best acorn for me to harvest? The answer is the acorn you can harvest the most of and the acorn closest to you with which you can get the most volume bang for your buck. And if you are lucky enough to live near bur oaks, answer, the answer for you probably is them. Uh, the ones in my neighborhood are golf ball sized on average. <laughs> we get some that are even bigger and those ones are a little bit terrifying, but we also get ones that are a little bit smaller too. They tend to keep their stylish hats on even after they fall and hit the ground. And that is important information for reasons we will find out soon. Honestly, Notable Nuts is just me talking about all of my favorite acorns. <laughs> These are the acorns of the chinkapin oak. I love it so much. It is named for uh, its distant cousin, the chinkapin, which is a tiny chestnut 
native to the eastern United States. And it's just because their leaves look similar. Though I guess they are in the same plant family. They are all in like the beach family. So they're distant cousins. I'll let it slide. Usually I hate when things are named that way. But for chinkapin oaks, I'll let it pass. These guys, while small and sometimes a little tenuous to crack, are absolutely delicious. I never believed that there were acorns that you could eat like with very little leaching. And these are those guys. I've even had a little nibble of them raw before and didn't get mad. Didn't even get mad. I love them. Also, they're beautiful. They almost look like little mahogany beads on the ground underneath their trees. Oh, they are absolutely one of my favorites. I, in terms of flavor profile alone, they're a little more sweet, almost a little more vanilla-y along with the nuttiness compared to other acorns that I harvest. If I could exclusively have chinkapin acorn flour, I would. Burr oak acorn flour is also delicious, but boy golly, it's not, it's not the, the chinkapin oak. So we have talked about the tori mook already, which is Korean acorn jelly. I wanted to just highlight a couple different instances of acorns being used globally. And with the tori mook, if you are someone who has made your own acorn flour, and you have already milled it really fine, so it's about as fine as you know flour you'd buy from the store is, and you wanna make the tori mook, my suggestion to you would be one parts acorn flour for five parts water in a pot on the stove, stirring constantly. If this is something where you want to set it and forget it, don't do it, otherwise you're gonna have chunks that are more set than other chunks, which, I don't prefer, um, so that's something you're gonna wanna stir constantly. And my friend Shell, who runs the Instagram page, Wild Food Around the World, always told me <laughs> when the bubbles coming up out of the mix resemble like prehistoric mud bubbles, that's how you know it's ready to be poured into a greased mold or bowl uh, to set. <laughs> Uh, just so you guys know. Oh, Nicole asks, can you make chestnut flour too? You absolutely can. I made some chestnut flour last week. It is also delicious. Sounds kind of like cooking cream of wheat. Yes, because that acorn starch will thicken up that water like this. I also love having like powdered acorn flour on hand because I just use it anywhere that I would be using corn starch or potato starch. Honestly, they're pretty interchangeable. Starch is magic. The starch in acorns is also what allows like acorn breads to stay together even though they don't have gluten. Oh, what was the name of the book mentioned earlier? Oh, the sci-fi book, Parable of the Sower. So good by Octavia Butler. More global acorn things. Licor del, oh, oh my goodness, Licor de Bellota is a Spanish. And when I say Spanish, I mean from Spain on the Iberian Peninsula, um, sweetened acorn liqueur, which is made by letting acorns and a couple other aromatics sit in a high proof alcohol until it turns that pretty amber brown. And then sweetening it, you can sweeten it with sugar, or if you're like me, sweeten it with a little bit of maple syrup because it also, with its water content, cuts how high proof the liqueur is. It is similar to making no chino, exactly. Um, you would want to leach the acorns a little bit first. You do want a little bit of that bitterness as you, as a lot of people enjoy in their different liqueurs or amaros or aperitifs. Um, but yeah, it's very similar to the no chino making process. Have you made stew with acorn to thicken it, Alexis? Yes, I have thickened many a soup uh, with acorn starch. Acorn starch is like tied with filet powder, which is powdered sassafras leaf, for me, in terms of soup thickening. <laughs> is there a way I can see the slides in chat at the same time? Oh, yes. Okay. You should be able to, 
actually, I don't know. From the user side, I can see my presentation on one side and then the chat on the other. You might need to make your screen bigger. Janet's also out here Googling Acorn Festivals and that's the energy that I want to see. That is the energy I want to see. Oh, Zachary said I had to turn my iPad sideways to see both. So if you're on your phone, you also might have to go sideways to see both. You guys are so helpful. No, Maddie, don't, don't blush. We just want you to have the best time possible. Can a beginning forager safely, oh, I keep jumping the gun and answering questions. I know Grace is probably like, Alexis, we have question time at the end. And me worried that I would rush through this class too quickly. Oh yes, Don, exactly. The only bad question is the one not asked. I 100% agree. So Acorn tool belt. I think going in with necessary tools makes Acorn processing a so much more pleasurable experience than it would be otherwise. And the tools you need really depends on how many acorns you feel like processing. I also do not know what order these pictures are going to come up in. So this is going to be a fun adventure for the both of us. Okay. And we're clicking. Ah, so we're starting with the big boy. For those of you not familiar, that beautiful piece of ironwork right there is called the Dave Built Nutcracker. I'm going to type it into the chat. Dave built nutcracker. And I'm going to break everyone's heart because like everywhere is sold out of them right now. I'm so sorry. Usually they make another round of them in the early fall so people can get them by Christmas. I'm still like crossing my fingers for everyone that that's going to be the case, but they also only make so many a year. I would suggest, oh yeah, Kim said I've tried to find one. My friend Tim just got one, and I would say checking things like Facebook Marketplace and eBay could yield good results. So what a Dave Built Nutcracker is, it is, it is an adjustable hand crank nutcracker with a hopper on top. So you can pour all of the nuts in at once, adjust the hopper uh, grinder size for what kind of nut you are planning on shelling. And then you just crank that handle and it will have them. And honestly, if the acorns are dry enough, a lot of times it will take the shells off for me too. And then spit them out underneath that wheel into a bowl. If I'm harvesting things like chinkapin acorns, which are delicious, but tiny, I always use my Dave Built because cracking those guys one at a time with a hammer, while possible, I've absolutely done it before with both a hammer and a nutcracker, can become tedious. That could also be, though, an instance in which teamwork making the dream work could come in. Have that acorn party. Have an entire table with hammers where people can get out their frustrations at the world by cracking a couple dozen acorns. Or asking, yes, next door neighbors, if there's one to share. I am planning on, once they are in stock again, donating one to my neighborhood library so people can check it out and borrow it when they need one. But I really need them to be back in stock. Also, there, if you're lucky enough to live in Portland, Maine, congratulations, your public library system has Dave Belt Nutcrackers that you can check out. And I'm very jealous of you. <laughs> I want that to become the standard everywhere. <laughs> yes, libraries of things are the best. Oh, man, I know, I know. Yes, so when you don't have the Mondo Nutcracker, sometimes just the old-fashioned handheld Nutcracker will do the job just as well. Sometimes it is cracking them with the handheld Nutcracker. Sometimes I'll use the handheld Nutcracker to hold them in place while I hit them with a hammer. Uh, that is probably my favorite method because it makes me less fearful that I will lose my thumbs. A thing that I am often quite fearful of. <laughs> now next, this guy uh, also is sometimes hard to get a hold of, but I do believe they are back in stock. He has the best slash the worst name. It is the grandpa's goody getter. I don't like the name, 
but I like the job that it does. So here we are. And when you are working with a larger acorn, like say a hefty American red oak or a burr oak acorn, this guy is amazing. You put him in the little vise, you put him in the little vise right here, and then you pull that handle down and it cracks him right down the middle, nice and easy. And it's wonderful for those bigger acorns that are maybe even too big to fit in something like a Dave belt. Um, or too big to fit in something like a nutcracker. Our Baroques are too big for the nutcracker we have in the house. <laughs> I also wonder if a holiday nutcracker could work for these. Honestly, sky's the limit. Are these good for butternuts and walnuts too? Yes. Grandpa's Goody Getter is exclusively what I use for black walnuts. And it is my favorite. And by favorite, it is the only way that I can get into black walnut shells. But no, it is great for butternuts and black walnuts. Also, this isn't so much for the cracking process. It's for the soaking process. I love to give my acorns, once they're shelled, a quick blend. I don't want them to be tiny grits usually quite yet. Uh, I want them to be able to sit in a mesh sieve because it is so easy, you guys, to have all of them in a mesh sieve and that mesh sieve in a bowl of fresh cold water. You let them sit in there and you know how you change the water instead of carefully pouring the water out and worrying that you're going to spill some of the acorns into the sink, the land of no return. You just lift up the metal sieve and then you dump out the old water full of tannins and then you refill the bowl and then you place it back in and the little handles help it stay suspended on the bowl. It's so nice. I have a million of those and it's pretty much for acorn processing season exclusively or save the water for toner. I do have some in a little container in the refrigerator for toner for me. A steamer basket, yes, will also work in a similar way. For sure. Oh, and then, yes, a hammer. <laughs> Honestly, sometimes it's really fun to get some pent-out ag aggression out. Just boom, hit him with a hammer. But when you're processing acorns, there are acorns that you should, yes, always wear goggles. Or if you're like me and have these giant glasses that comprehensively protect your eyes, protect your eyes. So, acorns you should not process. The obvious ones are ones with a big, noticeable hole in the side. I will tell you, though, that hole, many people think it's an entrance hole. It is not. It is an exit hole. When you see a hole like that, it doesn't mean, oh, maybe the acorn weevil inside just got started. No, it means it's done. It means a significant part of that acorn is now frass, a.k.a. bug poopies. And you don't want to eat that. So here I have an example of the culprit at work. That is an acorn weevil. And as cute as their snoots are, because they just have the longest, dumbest, cutest little snoots, uh, they are agents of chaos. Those guys will use those little snoots to boop, poke a hole right where he is on that acorn I'm holding in the picture, near where the cap meets the acorn. And that is how they will put an itty bitty little baby larva into the acorn. You can see these with your eyes. They are just a lot harder to notice than the big exit holes. So you just have to pay close attention and make sure you're looking completely around the circumference of that ring cap area for tiny pinprick holes. It'll look like someone stuck a needle in it and then pulled it right back out. Also, look for strange patches of discoloration on the shell. That doesn't necessarily mean that there's an acorn weevil or um, a moth larva inside. It might just mean that they, that acorn is already rotting. Also, if an acorn falls with their cap still on, yeet it, don't take it. A lot of trees will notice that something is wrong with an acorn and just boop, cut off that entire little stem piece and drop the whole thing cap and all. Except for species like burr oaks and other nuts where the cap grows a little bit around the nut. Uh, the nut can't fall out of that cap until it dries and shrinks a little bit. <laughs> so there are exceptions to that rule. 
BK says, what about discoloration on the inside of the nut when you crack it? Um, if you have dark discoloration on the inside of the nut, I would discard it because that means that part of it has started rotting or molding as well. Acorns are amazing, but because they are wonderfully so high in fat and carbs and water when they're fresh, they are very prone to spoilage. Um, a good way to keep acorns you've harvested from going bad is drying them before you process them. If they're starting to sprout, they're great. I will absolutely still process um, white oak acorns that are already pushing through the bottom uh, to grow their little tap roots. You can also freeze them. Uh, I also know some people who will freeze them to drive weevils out of the acorn and will still eat the acorns after the weevils have exited them. I don't know why. I'm very down with eating a lot of things that people would consider gross, but bug frass, I haven't gotten over that hump yet. I'm trying to. I mm, 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 Just knowing that a bug pooped there. I just don't. It's like the same reason why I don't like leaching my acorns in the toilet tank. It's too poop adjacent. You can dry them before or after shelling, but if you are collecting a ton and you don't want them to go bad before you process them, I would dry them first. Okay, thank you all for backing me up on also being anti-frass. I appreciate you. <laughs> So those tannins, we talked about them and how they don't do great things for our bodies. AKA the main reason I think that folks hesitate to use the big old pile of acorns that squirrels have formed a feudal economy around in their backyard. Because I truly believe that if squirrels were left to their own devices, they would absolutely form a feudal economy. I think that they are agents of chaos and are occasionally evil. <laughs> Alexis and Shauna say, I don't even want the coffee beans that are made from beans that were mm, naturally processed. Agreed. Agreed. I don't need that civet poop coffee. Let the civet keep his poops, you know? I don't know. Maybe he wants them. I don't. <laughs> it's really good, though. I, I believe you, Tracy. <laughs> I believe you. <laughs> so we have to get rid of tannins for humans to be able to enjoy acorns to their fullest ability. We're gonna talk about the long way because it's my favorite way. We're also gonna talk about a faster way and we're gonna quickly touch on the fastest way. Um, but the slowest way is cold leaching. That is the name of the process. Since um, is drying acorns just laying them out. If you are lucky enough to be in a dry enough place with enough sun, Yes, you can just put them on the screen and lay them out. Maybe put like a little netting over them so the squirrels don't think you've set out a buffet. But you can just lay them out. You also can put your oven on its lowest setting and pop them in on a baking sheet with the door vented. Like, you know, stick a wooden spoon in to keep the door from closing completely. That's also my favorite way to do makeshift dehydrating when I'm trying to dry something too big for my dehydrator. <laughs> So dry and shell them leach if you are not planning on processing the acorns immediately. Um, I do not often dry them first. I do have a set of red acorns that I have dried for later processing this winter, and they are still in their shells. What I typically do, though, is I will bring them home, I will immediately shell them, and I will put the acorn nut meats straight into cold water. Um, because the water is cold and because of how physics works <laughs> on a, on, you know, a cute little atomic level, cold water will leach tannins out a lot slower than hot water. Um, but it's worth it because it leaves the starches intact. Uh, you will have to change the water multiple times a day for the first couple of days. The chinkapin oak that I typically harvest from, um, even with the nuts just halved, we're about ready for eating after two and a half days of changing the water every six-ish hours, not including when I was sleeping. But when I ground the chinkapin acorns, they were ready in like a day and a half because of the exposed surface area. Great question, Zachariah. You don't have to grind the acorns up, but exposing more surface area will make the process go faster. 
Um, so literally that was the next thing. I suggest either giving your acorns a light blend to expose more interior surface area or making sure the whole nuts are leaching in the fridge to keep the fat content from going bad because it is going to take longer. You change the water until the acorns uh, don't taste bad. Everyone hates that that's the answer for how long do you let them soak. Um, some people will say to soak them until the water is completely clear several hours after placing them in. But I have had acorns rendered palatable with the water still being the slightest twinge of yellow from tannins. Yeah, okay. I also want to be eating whole acorns, so I have halved and quartered my burr oaks this year, and I am soaking them in the refrigerator. You can grind and mix different acorns for flour. Absolutely. Yeah, usually around when the water is sitting and stays clear several hours later, though that is not always the be-all end-all. So some folks do hack this in fun ways. Oh, like the top tank of their toilet. Uh, which I'm just like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, about. Or freshwater streams, which I get down with more. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. Thank you, guys. Oh, right? Why the toilet? And everyone who does it is just like, but it's in the top tank where the water is. I don't care. It's still poop adjacent. It's still poop adjacent. They will put them into a mesh bag and then put that mesh bag in the top tank of their toilet. So then every time your toilet flushes, all that water drains out into the bowl and it refills with new fresh water. And I'm like, okay, I get it. I get it, you're, sa you're saving water, you're saving time. Though, how many times are they going to the bathroom each day? That's one of my questions, but also no. Um, I, do not, I do not own land and I fear even the supposedly clean toilet water. Oh my gosh, Eden. Wait, oh my gosh, thank you for sharing. I have been looking for a nut soup recipe, so I will have to check out your tribe's recipe because acorn soup just sounds like the stuff of dreams. Thank you for sharing. Kanuchi. Okay, Erica, you're in the same boat as me, acknowledging that it is very efficient, but also poop. Oh, with shagbark hickory nuts. <gasps> okay. If we want to talk about another underrated nut, the nut of the shagbark hickory, why isn't everyone eating them? Why isn't it as popular as pecans? I love shagbark hickory nuts and I have a bunch sitting in my house right now. Oh my gosh, I need to try that Eden. Oh my goodness. I need to try. Oh, hickories are not toxic. Um, pecans are a hickory. They are all members of the Caria genus, but some are going to be more bitter than others. In the Q&A, I begged for a hickory class. Listen, maybe that's next fall's class. Maybe that's next fall's class. There are so many hickories. Does the toilet water folks use that for their facial toner too? Oh my God. <laughs> yay grace okay there we go next year hickories let's go <laughs> so there is a shorter way to prepare acorns and that is called hot leaching oh no carrie your hickory's massive this year and the squirrel's got most of the goodies the first word you ever saw was folks picking up pecans Ah, oh, fresh pecans are so good so good but I mean, honestly, so are fresh shag bark hickory nuts. I actually think I might like them better than pecans. Um, they're so good. What was I saying? Ah, uh, yes, hot leaching. Hot leaching takes significantly less time. And this is why I feel like it attracts so many people when they are learning about acorn processing. But some caveats. Boiling will break down the starches in your acorns. So... Oh, that should say so you can't make things like the Tori Mook or acorn bread because those starches are what hold those two dishes together. So no starch, no binding. Also, 
hot leeching acorns gives acorns a very different and very like not nut like texture <laughs> it makes them more it makes them extremely soft and more grainy which lends itself really well to some recipes and doesn't lend itself well to others so for this process you would be moving your acorns between new clean boiling pots of water every 30 minutes or so and you'd be taking them from boiling water from your like now tannin filled boiling water into clean but still boiling water there's a suspicion that putting hot acorns directly into cold water binds the tannins to them more heavily honestly from like a physics standpoint i don't know how that would be true but i do think it just takes longer so that's not a smart thing to do so you would be theoretically boiling some water while your other acorns are bubbling away cooking out some of their tannins you'd be bringing a new pot of water up to boil um, it will still take you a few hours, and that's a few hours of hands-on time. It's not like with cold leaching, where you wake up in the morning, you change the water, you go do your business, you come back six hours later, you change the water, maybe right before you go to bed, you change the water one more time. All together during the day, that's maybe 10 minutes of effort. But hot leaching, the last time I hot leached acorns, it took me four hours of standing at the stove. <laughs> Thank you, exactly. <laughs> but it is all about the preference. There are some dishes that are better suited for hot leached acorns. Acorn hummus is definitely one of those dishes or any kind of spread, it's beautiful. Um, and that is for adding acorns to your hummus or just using the acorns completely in place of the garbanzo beans because it really does get that kind of like melt in your mouth but slightly grainy texture that beans will get on the inside as well it feels much more like a bean to my palate when they have been hot leech oh the only time i've tried to use acorns we use this method oh we never used acorns again oh and that experience is why you're here well i'm glad that you're here what can you do with the leftover water is it okay to plant plant to water plants with tannin water it's so much standing at the stove. I've never watered plants with tannin water before. And now I need to ask one of my friends who's like a houseplant aficionado. My friend Ji Hao is like a sorcerer with houseplants. I'm going to ask him. <laughs> and I will get an answer for you guys. <laughs> but you can also, uh, I heard that you can and it deters pests. That would make sense. I feel like a tannin mist for plants if you're like worried about things like spider mites. I could see that being helpful, but I could also see it maybe accidentally drying out your plant leaves if you overdo it. So I'd be cautious. But yes, you can also use that water face toner. Is the first tannin water what you should save as toner? Yes. Yes, it is. There's also a microwave way. I do not know how to do it. Please do not ask me how to do it. It definitely breaks down the starches. I hear it's very fast, but I don't know if I trust it. Not because I don't trust microwaves. Microwaves are whatever. You know, we've all been in a rush. When I was on my way to fly out here on this trip, I was like, I do not have time to make myself an entire meal. So it looks like I'm putting a spicy fake chicken boca patty into the microwave and throwing it into my face like a hockey puck into a goal so I can run and catch this flight. Um, I just, it, people say it only takes six minutes and that just seems wild to me, but I'm going to try it this year so I can report back. It is on my list of things to do this week. And the method is detailed in one of the books that I have to recommend to you guys. Now we have some videos. For some of you, these might be some oldies. Okay, Boca Patty's on a paper towel when in a rush. Okay, yes. For any fellow vegans or vegetarians or people who just get down with Boca Burgers, sometimes that's what you need. But yes, now we have some oldies, but goodies. Um, <laughs> it reminds me of watching Mojo 94.9 with my mom as a child. We have some videos um, going deeper in depth 
with some of the recipes that I have made using acorns. Originally, I wanted this class to be like in the kitchen, but then I was like, but then I'll only get to show everybody one recipe and I won't get to tell them all of the other stuff that I love about acorns. <laughs> so here we are. Um, yes, Grace. I think we've got these videos preloaded in live stream. Do you mind if I um, try playing it to see if it works oh as well? Please do. I trust you guys more than I trust like the videos embedded in my presentation. <laughs> okay, perfect. I'm going to try and share. It's going to bump out your presentation just as an mm -hmm. FYI, but we can reshare. Um, and just to get the, the order of the videos, right, we're going to start with acorn jelly. Is that right? Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, here we go. We'll all keep our fingers crossed here. Ooh, I'll also say my pronunciation, this video is almost three years old. I did not know how to say Dottori Mook. Um, I very much went with a hey, we're like not an acorns oop, to make an, jelly. Um, I was wrong. It's wrong in this video. I know I was wrong. I want you all to know I was wrong. Okay, I love you. Enjoy the video. Okay, bye. Acorns to make jelly. Maybe I don't know. I might mess it up. Step one: make sure you have that good, good acorn nut meat, meaning they passed the float test by sinking and have soaked long enough that the tannins have thoroughly yeeted themselves. Time to blend. Blend them with a little water, cause we're gonna be collecting that starch. Acorn milk. It's the milk they don't want you to know about. Time to strain with the nut milk bag. Now up here we have our acorn ground, but what we need for our jelly is down here. It's settling time. Some facts while we wait. Acorn jelly originates in Korea, where it is known as Dottori Muk, and the acorn starch is a perfect dupe for cornstarch. Much like my college significant others, the acorn starch has settled. Just kidding, I was a damn catch then and I'm a damn catch now. Now add your starch to fresh water. Turn on that heat and mix. My girl is looking thick. Into the mold, into the fridge. Moment of truth. I put my thing down, flipped it, added sauce, and had acorn jelly. I can't believe this is made out of acorns I got off the ground. Yay, acorn jelly. Um, Astrid is asking if they need to float test. I would always float test even if you're being careful with the acorns that you're picking up and looking out for things like weevil holes just in case. I still always float test my acorns. <laughs> Yes. So the texture, sometimes I even see the Tori Mook translated as more like acorn tofu than acorn jelly. Um, I use it in kind of similar ways. I don't know. I've never like breaded or fried acorn jelly. I mostly just eat it as an acorn jelly salad like it's traditionally done in Korea. Can I float test after shelling them? Uh, no, you should float test before you shell the nuts. Um, at that point, if you're already shelling them, you're probably going to see the ones that are bad and are not bad. It's just uh, float test is meant to save you time shelling an acorn that is not eatable. There we go. These are great questions. Oh, explain the float test. Oh, that is great. And I thought I explained it in one of these videos, but I don't think I do. Flow testing is you bring home your satchel of acorns and then you dump them into like a large bowl or a bucket of water. All of the ones that float are bad. <laughs> it means there is an air pocket inside either from an insect eating some of the inside or rot uh, producing gas or breaking down some of the acorn meat on the inside. And the ones that sink to the bottom are presumed to be safe. Oh, and my Korean mom found out we foraged acorns. She was so excited. Oh, I never knew our people used acorns traditionally. Stop, that makes me really happy. And maybe you and your mom can go forage acorns together. That sounds like a lot of fun. I had my mom forage acorns with me for the first time last fall, and it was great. Oh, did someone say the video didn't play for them? No. No. Um... Any video links to be shared later. I know the whole thing is going to be recorded um, and posted onto the USBG's website. But I'm not sure why you didn't see it, um, Harine. I'm not sure. I'm sorry, guys. I, I don't know what happened. It played on my end. It played um, on mine as well, yeah. Okay, we'll try with the next video. And okay. um, yes, this program will be recorded. Acorn? 
Oh, let me skip this. Mine tried to play the video itself. Silly goose. Oh, the auto heart. <laughs> so next is a, is a video on acorn pancakes. Uh, this is one of my own recipes. Honestly, it can be even, it can be further simplified from how I did it in the video. Acorn I'm pancakes. Acorn <laughs> Sorry, Grace. I'm interrupting my own self. I'll, I'll let past me do the talking. My hair was so big that day. Oh my God. Case, a car we get from the trees. Ooh. These are acorns. They came from a tree. I ground these acorns and soaked them in water for two weeks and then ended up with these acorn grits, but we have to go smaller. I see you winding and grinding. Boom acorn flour. Meet your dries. They're gonna get real nice and cozy with your wets, otherwise known as oat milk, spicy nut water, aka no chino, and some homemade vinegar, but store-bought's fine. Look at the vinegar mother. Don't look at her, just kidding, she's creepy. Mix your wets. Mix your dries. Mix your wets and your dries. Now we're in business. Pour onto a hot flat of your choosing. Pancake pro tip, uh, when all the bubbles pop but they stay open spaces, they're ready to flip. <laughs> Okay, but y'all, these slap. Go find some acorns. Yay, acorn pancakes. I'm a sucker for a buttermilk pancake, which is why I made a vegan buttermilk for mine. You do not have to. Acorn pancakes can be so much more simplistic than that, but I really like that recipe. Would highly recommend. I think, I'm trying to remember what vinegar I used for that video. I think it was milkweed. I think it was milkweed. I had a really good vinegar mother in my milkweed vinegar. But yes, never look a vinegar mother in the eyes. They're like little acetic acid jellyfish. <laughs> okay, this is going to try and play and I'm going to have to stop it. Egg, no. Egg. <laughs> and then we have one more. This one is more recent. Uh, so you might recognize it. Oh no, did the video... No, it stopped playing. I guess I'll see Alexis moving though. Must be some sort of live storm bug. No. Let's see what happens with the bacon, acorn bacon, acorn <laughs> video. And oh, I refresh, but it freezes again. No. I do also wonder if it's a browser thing. That is a good call out, Olivia. But we should be okay once the recording is emailed. That's true. We will still get to see them. Thank you, Elizabeth. There's a troubleshooting link that the wonderful Elizabeth has placed into the chat. Okie dokie. And now let's learn how to make my silliest, but one of my favorite We're making acorn, acorn bacon. bacon. We're making... We're making acorn bacon. Acorn? Acorn? Step one, form an uneasy alliance with your local squirrels. Step two, harvest a bunch of acorns. Make sure there are no tiny holes in the top, no big holes along the sides. And usually I'd say make sure they don't have their hats on, but this is a baroque. They're very stylish. They keep their hats on after they fall. This is a bad nut. Ugh. This guy has a weird random dark spot. Bad nut. Ugh. We're home with our nut satchel. Let's give these guys a little float test. We got two floaters. The rest seem to be good to go. I'm going to be using this contraption to crack them open. It has the best slash worst name in the world. Grandpa's Goody Getter. Oh, nut smash. He's beautiful. Now make sure you peel off any of the remaining papery skin. Now put your nut meat and some water in a blender. Time to strain our acorn milk. You can set aside your acorn grits to make some acorn flour, but what we need for our bacon, weirdly, is the milk. Now it's time to go do something else, because those guys are gonna need some time to settle. You should never settle, though. Time has passed. All this stuff down here at the bottom? Yeah, that's acorn starch. Starch is gonna be a little better to start, so what we're gonna do is very carefully pour off this water at the top, because it's carrying those bitter tannins out. Say nothing about the dishes in my sink. We replace the water we poured out with some cool, fresh water. 
and then we wait for it to settle again. It's tomorrow now, so I've already changed the water about five times. Yeet, those tannins! So we should be good to go after this one. Now put some acorn starch, some salty mushroom dust, and some maple syrup into a bowl. Mixy, mixy. And then into a non-stick with a little oil. Swirl it until you get a nice, even, little crepey thing. If you have any gaps, just fill her in. A little fun fact while our terror crepe sets. So acorn starch typically is seen in the culinary world in the form of acorn jelly, otherwise known as the torimuk, which is a traditional Korean dish. And it's super tasty. I have a video on it from last year. It's bad though, don't go looking for it. I'm gonna redo it. You want this guy to cook in here until he's a sheet, not a goo pile. Now I've separated my creepy crepe into four strips and now we're adding some vegan butter to get things crispy. Trust the process. <laughs> Slip them if you're brave. Okay, but y'all, what do we say about trust in the process? Ding, sparkle, sparkle. Let's try a piece. Good crunch. I can't believe this worked. Savory, a little smoky because I left it in the pan a little too long. Some mapliness comes through. A little nuttiness even comes through from the acorn. Is it the same as bacon? No, you silly billy. But it is salty, meaty, and crunchy. It makes for a mean BLT. So happy snacking. Don't die. Shout out to Kim who said it looked like fur leather until I added the butter. It did. You're not wrong. <laughs> said in the, oh, in this video, you have a small amount of nuts. You typically work with small amounts at a time. Um, a lot of times I will work with small amounts at a time because I like to, I, I harvest little bits at a time over an extended period of time. So I will visit like those same fur oaks in my neighborhood every day for two weeks, only taking a little bit back at a time because I'm really choosy about what acorns I take home. And it takes about two, three weeks for those trees to work through and completely drop all of their acorns anyway. Um, there are some trees where that's not the case. The chinkapin oak that I typically harvest from uh, typically has just like hundreds of acorns on the ground. And for those, me and my partner will go and just fill a huge bag up, uh, especially because we know Everything that we don't take overnight will absolutely get eaten by the deer who live in that same area, which I want them to have some too, but also I really love chinkapin oaks. I'm like, we have to be able to share guys, <laughs> please. So it depends. It really does depend. But a lot of times I will bring small amounts of acorns home and just make one single dish with them. Ooh, could you make it into something like fruit leather though? <gasps> I've never dehydrated anything based in acorn starch before and now I can't stop thinking about doing that I have like a running list of all the things I need to try Ooh. <laughs> oh I get the stink eye from people in my neighborhood everyone who lives along the pocket park where those burnt oaks are definitely knows that I am the weird acorn girl um for sure for sure um some some of them have started getting curious enough to ask me what I'm doing and they are curious now about trying things made with acorns, but a lot of my neighbors think I'm weird. Oh, do you ever forage from the tree versus the ground? It depends. Um, foraging from the tree has some benefits. Like a lot of times you're getting them before pests get to them. Um, you're getting to them before other mammals get to them sometimes. So if I can reach them, that's the main issue. If I can reach them while they're still green and they're developed enough that a little jostling loosens them out of their cap, I will absolutely harvest them off of the tree. The thing that's beautiful with oaks though is they tend to be very large and a lot of times have unreachable branches, which is why waiting for them to fall for a lot of people tends to be the most convenient thing to do. But if you have an oak where you have access to the branches, absolutely harvest them when they're still a little bit green before they start falling. How do you tell with burr oaks uh, when they don't release from the cap? I give them a little shake. I give them a little shake because they will jostle within the cap if they're ready. These are all such great questions. Oh, okay, I'm gonna go past this and it's gonna try and play. No, skip. Come on, there we go. Yay, Cal! Oh, yes, tall gang, unite. Tall gang, unite. So the two books, and I'm sad that there's really only two that I feel 
strongly about recommending to you guys are Eating Acorns by Marcy Lee Mayer and Nature's Garden by Sam Thayer, who I am actually going to be seeing later today. I'm very excited. Uh, Sam is one of my very good friends now, which is a crazy thing for me to feel like. That's a crazy thing to be able to say because I look up to Sam so much. And so his book, Nature's Garden, while it covers a myriad of different plants all around North America, has a 40 page interlude in the second of it that is exclusively about foraging acorns. And it gives all of Sam's tips and tricks to why he is so good at bringing home acorn harvests that are so bug free. He is excellent at it. I have harvested with him before. He, it's, it's a gift. And he's not a slow acorn harvester either. He moves so fast and is so good at picking out quality ones with his eye. I'm getting there, but I'm nowhere near where he is yet. Um, and then Marcy Lee Mayer um, actually runs a company in Greece that makes acorn flour and supplies it to different restaurants around the world. I wish the recipes had more details, but I love the depth with which they go into acorn processing and all of the different ways that acorns are used globally. Um, it also has this like beautiful parade of the acorns in these beautiful glossy photos of acorns from around the world at the beginning of the book. Uh, so if you're just a big old plant nerd like me, I would highly recommend it just to look at the pictures. It's great. And even though some of the recipes are a little hard to follow, or in the case of one of them, references another recipe that is not in the book, <laughs> uh, it will give you great ideas and jumping off points for using your acorn flour in ways that are maybe a bit more imaginative than, say, a pancake or a crepe. So I would very much recommend these two. Kim, I'm so sorry. Every time I have a class, I'm just like, mm, I hope that your like Amazon or bookstore.org or you know thrift books cart is empty <laughs> because I'm coming at you with recommendations. And I only like recommending books that I have read and that stuck with me that I get really excited about talking to other people about. Uh, and that is these two books. Uh, Eating Acorns was recommended to me by another forager. You may know her on Instagram as Giant's Daughter. Uh, she is Rachel Alexandru, and she is a forager in Midcoast, Maine, and is one of the coolest people that I know. <laughs> Indie Bound, yes, is also wonderful for locally owned bookstores. Um, or if you're lucky enough to be a person who lives in Columbus like me, you can always call books into the book loft and they are so good about getting things to their store in a speedy manner um, or delivering it to you once they get it. We love supporting our small indie bookstores. Okay, I think, did I do it? I did it. Oh my gosh, you guys, you guys, we learned about acorns. Did you learn something new today? Wow, my twist out is like, I need to comb through these bad boys some more. Thank you for no one saying anything. I just got a zoom in of my face and I'm like, oh, ho, ho, ho. looks like they're fresh out of the rollers. Oh my goodness. There we go. There we go. <laughs> oh, you guys are wonderful. And I see that we have a lot of questions. I know that I've kept you guys for a while, but Grace, I, I'm still down to answer some questions. I have like 10, 20 more minutes before I have to go skedaddle and harvest some Wapato. Well, if we can keep you for 10 more minutes, that would yeah. be fabulous. Um, I will dive right into questions. Um, if you can, can you tell us more about the connection between um, Native Americans, Indigenous peoples, and the oak tree and acorns? Oh my gosh. I mean, the connection is extraordinarily strong. There's a reason why a lot of these forests across the country were oak dominated. And a lot of people thought that that was just the way that they happened, whereas they were definitely purposeful. Those landscapes were built through like mutual assistance between the indigenous peoples of the area and those oak trees. Um, I feel like the legacy of the oak tree and the indigenous people of the Americas is like intrinsically 
connected. Um, and there is a reason why one of the, you know, one of the few things that brought acorns kind of back into the spotlight is the fact that a lot of coastal Californian tribes never stopped eating them. Uh, thank goodness, because who knows if we would have found our way back to them as quickly. So I, I think that those two stories are like connected eternally with one another. And it's been really cool actually to have presence here from some indigenous people who are here like sharing their own tribes and other tribes as knowledge surrounding acorns. Some of my favorite acorn recipes are indigenous ones. And I mean, and a lot of that is probably because we don't have a lot of acorn recipes from elsewhere because Europe so thoroughly shunned the acorn out of their cuisine. Once things like oats, barley and wheat became so much easier for them to farm in mass. Thank you, Alexis. Our next question is, can you harvest acorns from any type of oak tree? You can. The only thing that is going to vary is how long they take to leach. Um, there are no acorns that are not edible, but I will say there are some acorns that their tannin content is high enough that you on a personal level may not think it's worth it. <laughs> There's one particular tree. Uh, if you live in downtown Columbus, it's like the big red oak tree across the street from the main police station downtown. I'm just gonna save you some time and say you don't need to harvest those. Those are the red oaks from the acorn pancakes video that took me two weeks of changing the water constantly to thoroughly leach. And along those lines, can you combine different types of acorns into one batch? You of absolutely flour? can. You absolutely can. If there's an acorn that you like the taste of over others, then maybe keep that one isolated and save it for special dishes. But I typically use a mix of different acorn flowers in my big jar of acorn flour. Perfect, thank you. And then once you leach the acorns, how, what is the best way to store them? And then how long can they be stored? Once you leach the acorns, you have a couple of choices. Um, you can take them and dry them and drying them will keep them shelf stable for a little over a year, honestly. Um, you just have to get them to dry, otherwise they will spoil. If you want to keep them in their hydrated form, say you want to roast acorns whole, or you want to add them into a dish where you want them to be like the nut in the dish as opposed to the flour, that's making up the dish, you can store them in a little bit of water in the refrigerator is what I would, is what I would do to keep the oil from going rancid. You can make acorn oil, Haley. In fact, that Sam Thayer sells acorn oil. It is very expensive because it's hard to make. Um, but I just invested in a little like candle heat hand crank oil expeller. So I'm gonna try and make my own acorn oil for the first time this year. <laughs> that is so cool. Acorn oil sounds delicious. Um, so good. We've got someone wondering, what is the minimum amount of acorns you would recommend harvesting to get enough flour to make it worthwhile? For example, to make a batch mm -hmm. of pancakes. Make a batch of pancakes. That's a really good question. That's a really good question. I would say to make it worthwhile, especially if you're feeding yourself and other people, somewhere in the vein of like half a gallon would probably be a good place to start. Um, that, would be, that would be my recommendation. Of course, that's going to vary depending on which acorns you're using, how many of them are good after you end up bringing them home. I'm trying to account for a little bit of error once you get them to your house. Oh gosh, people are talking about the book. Yes, there is an entire acorn chapter um, in the book. I literally am sending the acorn recipes to my recipe tester like on Monday. <laughs> that is what I've been working on for the last week or so. We are definitely looking forward to that book. I can't wait. Um, 
someone is asking, they're worried about oaks being sprayed with mm -hmm. pesticides. Is there any way to kind of counteract or what can folks do if they're worried about acorns that have been sprayed? I definitely think if it's an oak tree in your neighborhood and it does happen to be on someone's private property, it never hurts to ask. Um, my feelings about this are not necessarily everyone's. I acknowledge that like to a certain degree, everything is a little bit chemically these days. The stuff at the grocery store also has chemicals. The stuff in the park also has chemicals. And in this case, Plants are pretty good at trying to make sure that their progeny get the chance at life. And one of the ways that they do that is by not passing on a whole lot of toxins that the plant itself may take into their fruits. We see that happen with apples in that Boston like urban apple tree survey. And we see that happening a lot with tree nuts too. So when it comes to harvesting oaks in the city, I honestly don't think about pesticides as much as, or herbicides as much as I do when I'm harvesting, say something on the ground, like a dead nettle um, or a violet. Everything's chemically, wash everything. Thank you so much, Alexis. And uh, I just wanna thank you so much for this amazing program. I wanna thank everyone who attended today. Um, we're just so grateful that we're able to host you and I hope everyone has a fabulous weekend. Um, if you're looking for more programs like this, please check out our calendar at usbg.gov backslash programs. And you'll also be getting a survey in your email box. We uh, love feedback. So thanks in advance for filling that out. And thank you again, Alexis. Thank you so much for having me, Grace. I always love teaching these classes. Like, honestly, this is such a good way to start the day. I'm like, the sun is shining, but even if it wasn't, the sun would be shining for me today. This was wonderful. And all of you guys who attended are fantastic. Amazing questions, amazing energy. Thank you. I didn't even need coffee this morning. Look at me. Well, thank you so much and happy foraging for the rest of the day. Thank you so much, you guys. I know and happy foraging for anyone who decides to venture out this weekend and maybe peep some leaves. It's going to be peak leaf peeping season in my neck of the woods. <laughs> Love it. Thank you, everyone. And have a good rest of your weekend. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye.